go. So, Alan, how's it going? Did you enjoy the show tonight? Yeah, it was cool. It was good. It was, um, we played yesterday, I don't know, like four or five hours away or something. And, um, this was like a, yesterday was like a big, um, I don't know what you want to call it, like a basketball hall or something. So today was a bit more intimate, a bit more like a club show, and it was cool. I like it. You know, it was a good crowd, enough people, and everyone seemed to be into it, so it was good. Okay, so a few months ago, Primordial released their newest record, Redemption at the Puritan's Hand, and in the bonus DVD, uh, you talk about the lyrical meaning of the album, that it deals mainly with your thoughts on mortality and death and so on, and uh, what inspired you to this concept? Um, dying. <laughs> <laughs> no, <coughs> I'm been flipping them. Just growing old, you know. Um, Moving from the first or second phase of your life, which is your youth, into middle age, and realizing that you were approaching this, you know, just this, when you're in your 20s, you know, you think you're going to live forever. You don't think that anymore in your 30s. And into your 40s, which is the next step for me and the rest of the band. Um, that was the first thing. And then also, you know, with To The Nameless Dead, I looked at the monuments to war, the cenotaphs to soldiers who have lost their lives <coughs> or you know countless people giving their lives to uh, regimes or whatever and this time I began to look at the churches and the synagogues or the religious institutions that people give their lives to and I began to think about faith and spirituality and what it means to believe in something that you think gives you this afterlife or something like this um, I mean I uh, at the same sense we're looking at it but being godless or faithless you know we have no faith I'm a, ma I'm a man of logic and science so I don't have any space in my life for that so being a cynic I, I look at it like this and it's not anti-christian like typical heavy metal rhetoric it's about Faith, faith in our relationship to mortality and the structures we place upon ourselves to try and deal with the inevitability of death. Okay. to talk about a certain line in the song No Crave Deep Enough uh, where it says do you bring fear to the hearts of heathens when your breath is upon their neck and the gods will not answer and the sun is not in the sky and uh, to me it seems we want to express with that statement that no matter which spiritual belief we follow we all die at the end could you tell us about your thoughts in that song especially it's you know the, the pantheon of pagan gods are how we relate to the old system of beliefs and how we look at nature you know that hasn't changed in that I believe that you know you should live in syncopation or you should live in not in opposition to nature or something but at the same time it's not a spiritual thing so what I'm saying with that is listen God fucking whoever you want Buddha blah blah blah, blah. doesn't matter a fuck you're food for worms you're going to be in the ground and that's it. And so I just wanted to go, fuck you. You're dead. You're rotting flesh. You're in the grave. There's no spirituality. There's no redemption. There's no. There's nothing to save you. There's nothing like this. So uh, it was my way of saying, nah, people can disagree with me if they want. And maybe I might disagree with me in 20 years. Who knows? You know, because the eternal search for redemption and revelation or, is ongoing. But at this moment in time, it was my way of saying, listen, 
give me a look in the sky and, uh, you know, pray to your pagan gods or whatever, blah, blah, blah. It was my way of going, no, you're dead too. So, if you want, yeah. <laughs> uh, on this uh, album, the statement, no regrets, no remorse, seems to be very important as well. What do you want to express with that statement and in which context does it stand with the song Bloodied Yet Unbowed? That song is about like, it's inspired by things like Johnny Cash, Hank Williams, Waylon Jennings, um, old country, country and western. Uh, I'm really into this um, old 1950s, even Carter family, uh, redemption songs. Songs about trying to redeem your soul, where that you know you're a sinner and you've done bad, but you're trying to somehow do right by the people that love you. And so it's more, it's actually really inspired by old country and western stuff which I'm really into um, um, especially like Waylon Jennings and Hank Williams and stuff like that um, but it, it, it's more it's also about how the longevity of the band 20 years and it's just saying like you know more like saying to you like I'm sorry I punched you in the face in the nightclub I'm sorry I fucked your girlfriend I'm sorry I took your drugs I'm sorry I drank your fucking whiskey uh, but I'm just a human being and I'm, I'm flawed and I'm fucked and if you're living, you're doing those things. So, you know, to live, you have to have regret. In that sense. And then you just, you look at it and you go, you know what, fuck you, I have no regrets. I don't give a shit that I fucking smashed your cheek or fucked your girlfriend or drank your whiskey or took your drugs. And so, you know, it's, um, it's just about, it's a bit of a rebel thing, you know, trying to be, and not trying to be, just acknowledging the fact that, yeah, we're fucked. And so... Roll with it, you know. So it's so it's a very tried answer, but um, you know, or whatever. And it's just like you know, call me out on it, no problem. That's and that's what it's also saying, you know. So it's the you mean the wolves in ourselves? You sing about laying with the wolf, the animal and man. Yeah, it's it's that kind. It's it's saying that even though we try and sometimes live our lives in a honorable righteous way every now and again we fall off this path and that we do things that we do regret we we sit up at you know like we do answer that text um no it's about it's about having regrets it's about but it's also about acknowledging them and going you know what um fuck it i'm just a human being this is the way it is and because uh, you had too many people live their life um to neither of one extreme you know it's just they're neither disciplined enough and they're neither reckless enough. It's just a flat line of a life. So it's me saying, you know, uh, this is not the way I choose to be or try to be or, I don't know, it's whatever, you know. It's just a rock and roll song. It's actually just rock and roll. It's about sex, drugs and rock and roll and fighting and fucking and fuck you and, you know, whatever. And it's also a bit dedicated to, like, you know, Destroyer 666. Somehow. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, in the same house. Uh, you played tonight this exclusive club, club gig here at the Steinbuch Theater, and in two weeks you will play the Christmas Metal Fest in Germany as well. Apparently. Will you be staying here or do you head home till then? Are you joking me? <laughs> no, I'm going home. Um, uh, no, we. we um, it's a weird thing, you know, touring is not the same as it used to be there's a big pressure on that um, festivals and what they are killing touring so to go out like Tear and Moonsour are bravely doing for three or four weeks and playing in small clubs you know from Sunday to Thursday it's dead it's fucking dead I mean think about this if you were from Bremen and uh, there are three bands you want to see and they're playing in Hamburg which is what two hours drive from here no no not from no if you live in Bremen you going to Hamburg? Ah, really? Two, two and a half hours. So those three bands are playing at a f at festivals all summer, but you want to see them in February. Are you going to get in your car and drive like through the freezing cold and the pissing rain to see these three bands? And this is what happening is that the festivals are killing touring. It's very hard. I mean, it's very very hard for bands to tour anymore. And I mean, because they don't sell any records anymore, the only way they can live is merchandise. 
And so how do how does it keep surviving? You know, in five years, I don't know. I, I don't want to think about how fucked it's going to be. Um, for us, all summer we've just been doing weekends, 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 weekends. And we did one, like, 12-day tour with Alceste and While Heaven Wept, which thankfully did very well. It was timed in the right place. Like, only clubs is as full as this, you know, two, 200, 160, 250, yeah. or whatever. But still, I mean... It's a hard job, man, to go out on Monday after 20 years of playing to play to 42 people uh, in Osnabrück on a rainy, cold, minus six night. Um, and so we, we're, I think we're just getting too old to do that anymore. We have to come and play our proper weekends and time it right, you know. So this was timed right. Yesterday was a cool show with Ensa Ferrum and Immortal, and this was a cool club show. But tomorrow... Maybe someone books us in the middle of absolutely nowhere and 62 people show up. And when 62 people show up, you're going, okay, so we all, you know, some of the guys have kids and blah, 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 and all this responsibilities. And you're like, is it really worth taking a day off work to play for, you know? When you're 20, it's no problem. But it's, uh, anyway, rambling bullshit answer, but yeah, it's complicated, you know? Okay, this is uh, a good beer. Beer from his area. He's promoting this. <laughs> Um, so how, and how do you like Germany in general when you're not playing? Do you find time to explore the city you are currently in? And it depends. It depends on... I mean, this summer it's been very bad because every weekend or every show has been a 5 a.m. airport meeting, 7 a.m. flight. You get there at 10, you sit in a van for five hours, and then all you want to do is sleep when you go to the hotel for two or three hours. So you could be in an old medieval city, and you don't, um, and tear really suck. Uh, no, hey, hey, sorry, no. What did you say? <laughs> hey, what did that bow guy say? <laughs> no, um, I he's no, been. No, come here. What's up? Harry from Tear. Harry, no, Terry, Terry. Terry. I just want to say that this guy <laughs> is the worst, the worst singer in the whole world. I can't <laughs> explain. <laughs> No. This coming, from the, this coming from the sexiest man of pagan metal. <laughs> Why can't you give me a kiss? No, 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 no lips, no lips in public. Only whiskey Allen can do that. Yeah, he can only do that. <laughs> anyway, <Yeah. laughs> the, point, the point being that um, tears still suck. Uh, <laughs> No, the point being is that, you know, I mean, part of the thing that makes this, you know, I mean, playing in a band is, or doing what you always wanted to do, is you'd be a fucking asshole to complain about traveling around and, you know, playing music and all this kind of stuff. You know, I mean, what sort of dickhead complains? He goes, oh, you know, I don't like the backstage and blah, blah, and I don't like this and blah. It's bullshit. But at the same time, sometimes you are, you're thinking to yourself, well, I, I have to sleep to get some kind of sleep. Um, but you're in a medieval city you've never been in before. Sometimes mm -hmm. you think, so what do I do? Blah, you know. What? And this summer, this year has been the worst ever because it's been as early as possible all the time to the airport, 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. And you're just sitting in the airport, blah, 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 you know, like, and it can suck the joy or suck the strength out of you for playing. But um, if the show's sucked as well, then I'd have to question, what the fuck am I doing? But the shows, thankfully, are better than ever. So uh, yeah. you need to see a charitable growth. You need to see some movement, you know? And I don't know how it must be for bands who've been doing it for 20, 25 years, and they're coming and are playing on a Tuesday night to 27 people, 32 people. Yeah. Because it happens all the time, you know? So, but I don't remember what the question was, but you know what I mean? Yeah. So let's talk a bit about uh, music in general. I know that you are a very uh, old school type of guy who hates all this digitalized pro tools and trigger sound. And what I ask myself is um, how the music or the metal business will look in 10 or 15 years with this growing MP3 generation. What do you think about that? It'll be, it will be fucked. Um, you know, I mean... I think that you can scratch the word musician off potential profession in at least five years. Um, it's gone. It's done. Um, we're living in a cultural ice age where people think that 
every single thing that somebody else creates should be available to them for free. And I understand that, for example, to the Nameless Dead, if, if it's all 30,000, several hundred thousand people know that album. And I understand that they might come and see you and buy a T-shirt or something. But at the same time, what you're doing is you're, the environment is being created, especially for people who are in their mid-teens, who think that every single thing should be available for free to them. Yeah. And n because the music, because the record labels fucked everyone for 50 years, hmm. like 24 euro for a CD and 20 euro for a CD at home, are you joking me? A CD that costs 1 euro 30 to make? Whatever, anyway. Um, they fucked everyone for so long, now everybody's going, fuck you. But the problem is that they're fucking the bands as well. So how, if no one shows up to see a band on tour, like if, if a band plays a festival, right, you know they take 30, 40% of your merchandise. All the middle bands are fucked because the old bands are charging so much money to play. And I'm, you know, like, I'm not going to go into it, but numbers that you couldn't fucking believe. If they're charging so much money uh, to play, and then all the middle bands are being like squashed because they're like, well, if we're paying such and such band from the 80s several hundred thousand euro to play a show, why should we pay you five? And you're like, um, well, after the volcano, there's no cheap flights. There's no cheap flights. You know, you can't fly from Ireland to Germany anymore for 69 euro. So our fee goes down. Then people wonder, why are the shirts 30 euro? Our, shirt, our shirts aren't 30 euro. But the point being that, like, they wonder, like, oh, so everything is coming up. And what you're creating is this, this um, how can we say, this era, this age where the people are becoming to resent the bands because they think they're paying too much for the tickets, too much for the merchandise. But if they realized how much they were being fucked by promoters who do what the promoters do, fucking nothing. Generally, yeah, okay, email that, yeah, do that, pff, whatever. Who books festivals? Me. How do you feed your kids if you're a musician? Yeah. And in five years when there's no more Judas Priest, no more Iron Maiden, no more Motorhead, yeah. No more deal. Well, no yeah. more deal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when there is no more all of these old bands, yes. who headlines? Who headlines the festivals? Yeah. Who is there to pay? Who yeah. plays? Are, six, are 80,000 kind of people show up to say bands who never sold a million records? I, you know yeah. what? I don't think so. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, look, I'm too old to give a fuck who I offend. Uh -huh. I don't care anymore. But the point yeah, is that, yeah. but the point is, I'm saying things that pe everyone in the industry has known for 10 years. Um, so, who says this? I mean, Metallica, are what, 53, 52? Lemmy's 67. Yeah. Glenn Tipton mm. is 64. Mm. So, when all these people, Bruce Dickinson is 54, how yeah, long yeah. can they keep going? Yeah. Right, yeah. So, where are the new generation of bands to take their place? And the answer is, they're nowhere. Because they're selling 5,000 records. Because yeah. no one is buying their records. Yeah. Uh, because they don't give a fuck. And then they yeah. come to the show and go, oh, why are the t-shirts 20 euro? Because you took the album for free. That's why. Yeah. So fucking work it out, you know? Yeah. However, anyway, you know? <laughs> Sorry, you're getting the real truth out of me, you know? <laughs> I'm too old to care about who I offend anymore. Yeah. I don't give a shit, you know? Yeah, so, you know, it's just... But it is. It, the metal scene is actually headed for a really weird place where a band can reform who haven't played in 20 years and go, hey, in 1992 we sold 120,000 records. Yeah. Right? So, therefore, we're due 20,000 euro. Oh, I see. What about the band who sells way more than you now? And if you run and you release your new album, it sells nothing. But because you charge so much, that band are paid nothing. So it goes, you know, I'm not bitter. I don't care. <laughs> I'm too, uh, you know, I really, I don't give a shit. I just think that people should say these things, you know, so people understand what they're doing. When you think, when you think to yourself, oh, you know, I'm not going to go and see Rod and Christ at their club show that's 45 minutes from me because I'll see them at the festival and I'll buy the shirt there. Think about this. That shirt gives them no money. Yeah. Go and see them at the club show yeah. and buy their album from them and buy their t-shirt from them. Otherwise, yeah. five years, no more running Christ. Yes. And then what do you do? Yeah. What, then, 
What are you going to do? So anyway, yeah. only the underground, and even the underground's dying as well. So. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Well, uh, on I think the edit that. that was a fucking ten minute long answer. It's <laughs> good. Uh, on the primordial homepage, I saw a banner in memory of Bon Scott. D ah. Did he had an influence on you as a vocalist? Oh, this is my favorite band. Yeah, they rule. Yeah. Um, and you know, we d I don't want to be Bon Scott because he's obviously he died from <laughs> stuff. But sometimes we had this saying like in the band, "What would Bon Scott do?" And he would take that fucking shot of whiskey and get into <laughs> get get into trouble. And uh, no, I just we always all it's the one band we all agree on. We love ACDC. And I love that playful, rebellious, Loki-like spirit of Bon Scott, yeah. you know, just to, with a smile and a bit of sense of humor, be able to turn everything on its head. Great lyricist. Maybe not the most, maybe not the greatest rock and roll singer ever. He's not David Coverdale, but I wouldn't change it. So, yeah, no, ACDC, it's, it's the best band, I think. And what do you think about Brian Johnson? I love Brian Johnson. Um, I love flying the wall. I love flicker the switch. Yeah. I don't give a shit. Um, and he's a real rock and roller. It's nothing to do with anything. But he's a, he's like a car mechanic from the north of England, who sang in Geordie. I mean, how more rock and roll can you get? Yeah. Whereas Whereas Bon Scott sang in Fraternity, a hippie band. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, Brian Johnson is probably actually more of a real rock and roller. Yeah, I think so. And however, you cannot argue with his voice on Back in Black and for those about to rock. That's And, you know, I, I listen to it, and it's like, holy f how is he doing that? That's <laughs> but, no, I love it. I wrote Tattoo, fucking, oh, UFO and Lizzie. Um, all we did when we listened to the new promoted album, I listened to Bad Company, UFO and Lizzie, uh, just old 70s rock. Uriah Heep, David Byron, and all these great oh, yeah. vocalists, and just went, listen to this. <laughs> how the fuck? <laughs> If I can reach 20% of uh, Paul Rogers or whatever in, in Free or Bad Company, I'm doing all right, you know. So, I don't know if I do, but <laughs> so, I have um, a go. Al, my first question is, um, on the Bones DVD of Redemption at the Puritan's Hand, you talk about death of the gods and how it deals with inheriting deeds and misdeeds of your ancestors and mm. your rejection on that concept. And, you know, we as Germans, we can kind of relate to that, you know, with the Third Reich and such. And you so say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> um, I think there is an incredible, the, the start of that song is there's an incredible guilt on behalf of, now I'm going to have to choose my words very carefully, about Western white indigenous people who inherit the historical misdeeds of people who have nothing to do with them. Yeah. And therefore, people say, well, this is what our ancestors, two generations, or our non-ancestors, two generations, did. You know, these autodictats who... Um, allowed most of the atrocities of the Second World War to happen. And therefore, and I have to say, I, you know, I was listening to this thing on the radio. This is, what, this, song, this is where the song came from. And this guy said, you know, he was talking about Haiti. And he said, we in the West must acknowledge our misdeeds, our colonial misdeeds in Haiti. On Irish radio? And I sat there thinking, you know what? Fuck you. What the fuck are you talking about? I'm to blame for an earthquake? Really? It's my fault there's an earthquake. Nothing to take away from the tragedy of the people from Haiti or whatever. You know, because, I mean, if you look into their history and the rebellions against the French and the English, I mean, it's incredible history. But at the same time, he didn't talk about that. He said, you're, more or less, you're to blame for this natural disaster. And I thought, this is fucking bullshit. So I thought, why, sh why are people being constantly uh, told... They, You're to blame for this, even though it's nothing to do with you. So I thought, fuck you. We are conquerors. So delight in the fact, in that fact, you know, just to yeah. be the opposite. Yeah. Not necessarily exactly what I believe, but just to be, fuck you, you know. Um, so it started off in this kind of like, we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't be allowed this eternal perpetuation of guilt to be placed upon our shoulders purely because we have been brought up in a society or in Western society that has brought about the Enlightenment, the, re you know, um, the Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution, whatever. No one ever says that. They only ever say, oh, well, 
colonialism and this is what you did. And this is the irony is that I'm from Ireland, so therefore the English did that to the Irish. But at the same point, I, I, I had to acknowledge that irony and we had to go, okay, the concept of death of the gods was more like, these are the old gods that I can see. Like when I mentioned in the last verse, all these old Irish Republican heroes, and I say, what do they give their lives for? Um, what do they give their lives for so that you could sit on your ass and watch reality TV and not vote in an election and not give a fuck about anything and not know who your ancestors are and not know your history, blah, 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 blah et cetera, et cetera, infinitum. And this was where it all started. So it's very much a, a it's about a alienation and a disassociation between modern Western society and, you know, like um, this, uh, this, this, it's about, how can we say, the disconnection between Western society and its old gods. And he's, you know, and that's how, the, it's weird how songs start. It started from a radio interview I disagreed with. Because yeah. I just went, oh, fuck you, there's nothing to do with me. Yeah. Stop placing guilt on me, you cunt. Um, and I was right. But at the same time, so it, it unfolded like this, yes. you know? So. Yes, okay, cool. Um, next question is, um, to the nameless dead in the booklet, um, the notes under the lyrics of Empire Falls, it says, the, the final words are, where is your fight? Is it for this we die? So um, what I'm getting out of this is modern society, modern people, human beings nowadays, are they lazy? Do they, have they lost their will to fight? It's interesting because, you know, I wrote that before, we're witnessing the current economic recession and we're, we're looking at a, an entire banking system, um, a governmental banking system that is scared of what happened in Athens, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, if what happened in Athens, this conflagration of social unrest spread to the whole of Europe, where would we be? And I guarantee you this, it will spread to the Mediterranean first, to the Catholic countries. Um, that's another argument. Um, but imagine the whole of Europe in flames. In Par Look at Paris, the, you know, the riots in Paris. Look at England. England went up in riots just because people wanted new trainers. Um, and you're looking at an entire class of people that have been ignored by the social or governmental system for the part of two decades since the collapse of the Berlin Wall, collapse of communism, and the birth of true, unfettered, unregulated capitalism. And now they are homeless. Yep. They, uh, it's, it's a very dangerous time we're living in. So, you know, um, what was the question again? Yeah, the, this was actually slightly inspired by, what is it, Michaela Pollock, this film, um, the Fight Club thing? You know, this slight thing like, where's your fight? What do we do? We just... Do we just consume, or do we all of a sudden stand up and go, actually, I think this is wrong. Do we actually stand up for any human rights? Do we actually stand up for uh, something and go, because, you know, like, if you burn down the governmental buildings and if you burn down the things you see in opposition and refuse to go, and just, or cease to go, eh, well, shit, whatever. People do, they will listen to the majority of people, because I think since the 1920s, you know, in the birth of marketing and free market capitalism and all this kind of stuff, uh, the, 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 the majority of the uh, human race has been sold a dream, which is that you consume based upon what you think you need, not what you actually do need. Yeah. And therefore, um, war is an industry, and if all of a sudden people wake up and go, what the fuck? And not a bunch of fucking hippies camping out in the square. Violence, proper violence. Because that's the only language this world understands, which is that, and to just annihilate, you know, burn these things to the fucking ground, burn your governmental buildings. What, um, what changes then after this conflagration? Yeah. There's something, I think this was. <laughs> <laughs> it's just about, and also it's about, it's about the game. Um, Emperor Falls is also about uh, the Golden Dawn about Crowley again, and every 2,000 years there's a, a, an empirical cycle, which is the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, we're now reaching the end of the Judeo-Christian Empire, um, for me, which is, as we're, we're witnessing China bailing out 
Europe. So therefore, this is another, this is the birth of a new empire, uh, which is the Far East taking control over Europe financially. And so this is, that's also empire falls, yeah. okay. which is us. Yes. Okay. Very interesting. Um, next question is based more upon music. Um, primordial, of course, you know, Irish. Um, you can hear the traditional Irish rhythms and notes in your music. Do you get any fans that listen to you not? You know, because they're oh yeah, <laughs> you know that you know they may be non-metal fans, but they listen to you because you're Irish, and you know they may they may like you know what you sing about your your lyrics. And such. Sometimes, not really. I mean, you know, the distance between traditional Irish music and an average heavy metal fan is very very far removed. Yeah. You know, it's. And they can. I mean, I think that Promoter is one of those bands that somebody who doesn't like heavy metal could listen to it and go. Uh, well, I can hear this, you know, it, it, okay, unless it's like pop music or something, they can go, uh, I can hear the the chord structures, the 6-8 the timing, the dark chord structures, and they can go, you know, they could go, and they have often said to me, well, you know, I like Nick Cave, and I like Leonard Cohen, and I like Sigur Ross, and I like all these bands, but I actually like Pomoni as well, because it has this droning, monotonous, dark kind of thing, and that's fine, but as for actual Irish traditional music fans, I'm not sure they could listen no. to Memorial. <laughs> but at the same time, it's not like, you know, so you never know. Is it? But yeah. never the trench for me. They don't usually come together. But we use yeah. the yeah. this one, two, three, four, six, one, two, three, four, six, one, two, three, four, six, the six, eight timing. Yeah. Uh, we use that all the time, and no other heavy metal band uses that. True, yes. Uh, we call it, um, if you want to know how it's explained, it's called Rashers and Sausages. <laughs> Rushers and sushes, one to three, four, six, one to three, four, six, one to three, four, six. Okay. Yeah. And that's that's six eight. That's the sixth in the yeah. timing. You know, it's it's, it's that simple. But no, most so. It's oh, I can't do it. Six eight. Anyway, yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> um. Explained in a yeah. Bad way. <laughs> Um, you know, Primordial started, or definitely has its roots in, you know, black metal, and to this day you seem to still use a form of corpse paint. You know, not the black and white, but you still have the white and the blood going. What does that mean to you? What does it represent? That's where we came from, black metal. Um, we're not a bunch of ex-power metal fans who decided to play pagan metal. Um, that's where it's where we came from. Is Bathory, Celtic Frost, Venom, Merciful Fate, and then this this early, this second wave, a Master's Hammer and Rotting Christ and Varusron, Old Mayhem and stuff. And so we were a part of that, ninety two, ninety three with our demo, and that's what we always felt was to be a part of this early, second wave black metal scene, because we had, it had nothing to do with what most modern pagan metal bands consider their musical heritage. It's nothing to do with that at all. And and for me it's very important. It's a it's a, it's a it's a focus. It's a thing you do to you know, um how can we say um to create this Jekyll and Hyde kind of atmosphere, you know, to focus your energy and go like right now we're about to play a gig. Yes. So it's like a ritual it kind of ritualistic in its own sense, and for me, yeah, it is. And I, I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could not do it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I don't want to be like some fucking fifty-two-year-old fat cunt uh, playing songs that are twenty years old or whatever. When the time is right, you quit. Um, but at the same time, um, no, it's I've always where my heart has always been black metal. Okay. Um, always since the eighties, late eighties. So um, that's the way I feel it has to be this way. And if people think it's disingenuous or contrary sometimes to the sound of the music, that's also the point, is the paradox. Mm -hmm. Is that you get a melodic vocal, or you may get a melodic passage, but wrapped in this fist of steel, which is this old school metal image. And I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think it's important. Okay. Good. Um. Next question, um, 
What do you think about bands, you know, specifically black metal bands that incorporate their political ideologies, you know, it doesn't matter right wing, left wing, you know, it's a often discussed theme, so what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I don't care. I mean, uh, for me, originally black metal was apolitical in that it was a um, a form of a sort of occultic spiritual movement or something neo-spiritual movement that had nothing really to do with politics but then you had people who were you know pagan black metal NSBM whatever you want to call yeah. it um, I might have no people do as they do all right Alan that's it thanks very much for your time thanks <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the awesome show, of course.